Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery, another antiquarian goodie for you this hour. We're going to take a break from Mr. Robert Fortune for a while. I mean, come on, seven episodes already. Let's move on to something else that has been requested more than a few times at the China History Podcast, and not just by my esteemed Swedish listeners from others as well. Sven Hedin, one of the great explorers, adventurers, cartographers, and all-around man of guts and fortitude to come out of that legendary age of 19th and 20th century European explorers. He was one of the most renowned explorers of his day. He was contemporary with Oral Stein, though Stein was more of an archaeologist and Hedin and explorer, cartographer. Both of them were big stars in their day. Sven Hedin lived for 87 years, from 1865 till 1952. That was a life whose arc spanned the years from Lincoln's assassination all the way to the Korean War. Quite a bit of history happened during those decades. Stein lived from 1862 to 1943. Stein, of course, is the better remembered because of his discovery at Dunhuang, something that immortalized him. And when Oral Stein broke into the Mokau Caves in 1907 and beheld the Diamond Sutra, the world's first printed book dated to the year 868, 587 years before the Gutenberg Bible. Stein carried a certain book in his bag, and this book is the volume from which I will read from in this episode. It was called Through Asia. I'll be reading from volumes one and two. There's no volume three. Stein not only had the benefit of the content contained in this book, which chronicled Sven Hedin's first expedition in 1897 through present-day Xinjiang, Kyrgyzstan, the Pamir Mountains, and Taklimakan Desert. Stein also enjoyed the benefits of the maps that Sven Hedin produced from this expedition. So although Stein is the better known, it was the great Swede, Sven Hedin, who you can say blazed the trail for the eventual discovery of the caves at Dunhuang by Mark Oral Stein. Sven Hedin besmirched his name and his legacy because of his later support and expression of admiration of all that Hitler was doing in Europe. His association with the Nazis, though never one himself, later made him persona non grata at a lot of places. He was already well into his late 70s by then. His best days were already behind him. So it was probably quite painful to have enjoyed all the accolades for so long and then fumble the ball almost at the goal line. Anyway, this China Vintage Hour selection will cover several chapters from Volume 1 of Sven Hedin's Through Asia, published in 1898. As I said, he traveled and explored throughout Xinjiang and the surrounding lands of Central Asia. If you don't mind, I'm only going to focus on the chapters that concerned his observations made inside what is today China. The narrative he gave, meeting and hanging out with Kyrgyz people in the 1890s, is priceless. But I'm going to focus on Sven Hedin's time spent in and around Xinjiang. In fact, after a brief excerpt from the preface, I'm going to start with Chapter 19, Reminiscences of Kashgar. I hope you enjoy it. This work does not claim to be anything more than a plain account of my journeys through Asia during the years 1893 to 1897. It has been written for the general public and presents nothing more than a description of my travels and the more memorable of my experiences, not by any means the whole of my experiences. To have recorded everything that I set down in my notebooks would have swelled out the book to twice its existing length, Nevertheless, those portions of my journey, which I have merely touched upon or have passed over altogether in silence, will not, I trust, be altogether lost. If this book is received with the indulgence which I venture to hope for it, I propose to issue a supplementary volume to contain a multitude of matters of varied interest and of not less importance than those contained in these pages. The astronomical observations, which I made for the purpose of checking and controlling my instrumental calculations, consisted of determinations of latitude and time in 17 several places. The instrument I employed was a prismatic circle, and the object I observed, the sun, or failing that, the moon. 
Mr. Rosen, who has kindly calculated my results, is satisfied that the errors in the latitudinal observations are in every instance less than 15 seconds, and in the temporal determinations in all cases under one second. The longitudes of certain of the stations were already known with scientific exactitude. These data I employed as bases for the determination of the longitudes of the remaining places. By this means, too, I was enabled to check more effectually the accuracy of my chronometers, a circumstance the more needful seeing that these latter were frequently subjected to the rough vicissitudes of travel through difficult regions. I brought home latitudinal observations for seven fresh places and longitudinal observations for six. For the original calculation of the altitudes which occur throughout these pages, I am indebted to the kindness and skill of Dr. Nils Ekholm. For the conversion of the metric heights and other measurements into feet, miles, etc., and for the conversion of the Celsius scale into the Fahrenheit scale, as well as for the transliteration of the place names, the translator is responsible. Finally, it gives me pleasure to acknowledge a special debt of thanks to Mr. J.T. Bealby, B.A., sometime of the editorial staffs of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Chambers Encyclopedia, etc., for the ability and experience and conscientious care with which he has rendered my original Swedish into English. In the translation of a portion of the book, Mr. Bealby was assisted by Miss E.H. Hearn. Sven Hedin, Stockholm, 1st of May, 1898. Reminiscences of Kashgar. I remained 50 days in Kashgar, waiting till my eyes got well. This time I employed in working out the results of my journey up to that point in arranging and tabulating my observations and plotting out my maps. The rest was indeed very welcome, in fact absolutely necessary. I thoroughly appreciated the hospitality of my friend's house where I was surrounded by all the comforts and conveniences of civilization. Consul Petrovsky is the most amiable man in the world, in every way a right excellent host. His intellectual conversation was as instructive as it was elevating, for he is a thorough man of science to his fingertips. During the years he had been stationed at Kashgar, he had made many discoveries and observations of the greatest value for history and archaeology. Someday he intends to publish them to the world, his library contains a selection of the best books that have been written on the subjects connected with Central Asia. He is also a laboratory fitted with the most costly instruments and scientific appliances. It would be absolutely impossible to have a better base than Mr. Petrovsky's house for a series of exploring journeys in the interior of Asia. I have already described Kashgar in the vicinity in my former book, Suffice it, therefore, to say here that the old town stood there on the banks of the Kizil Su, every whit as gray and solitary as when I first saw it in 1890. I add, however, a few words about the Europeans and Chinese with whom, during this visit, I was brought into contact. The members of the consulate embraced Mr. Petrovsky and his wife, his secretary, two military officers, a revenue officer, and a troop of half a hundred Cossacks. Adam Mignatiev, a Roman Catholic Pole who went out to Kashgar ten years ago as a missionary, was still there, a standing guest at Mr. Petrovsky's table. He was a fine old man with a smooth, shaven face and snow-white hair, was dressed entirely in white, wore a rosary round his neck with a cross dependent from it, and looked like a cardinal out of office. We used to rally him over the dinner table, but... He met all our illusions, even the most embarrassing, with a jovial smile and resented nothing, so long as he got his full number of drams. The only person who put faith in his pretensions to missionary zeal was himself, for during all the ten years he had been in Kashgar, he had not made a single proselyte. Indeed, he had made no serious attempt at conversion. He boasted that he had converted one old Sart woman on her deathbed, but the malicious declared that the old woman was already dead when he converted her. During the following winter, Adam Ignatieff often used to visit me in the evening, and many was the lonely hour he thus helped to shorten by his conversation. We would both sit over the fire till well on into the night, and he would relate to me the various episodes of his adventurous life. He told me how during the Polish rebellion he had helped to hang a Russian priest, for which deed he was banished to Siberia and remained there about thirty years. He was of noble blood and belonged to the family of Dogvio. But he was then living half a wastrel in Kashgar, a lonely man, forgotten, 
friendless, with none to care for him or take any interest in him, with none to shed a tear over his grave when the end of his days should come. Nevertheless, he was always cheerful, always friendly and jovial, perfectly contented with his lot. And so we used to sit, talking over the fire like a couple of hermits. I also found in Kashgar another old friend and Father Hendricks. He was in all respects a remarkable man, who had been domiciled in the town quite as long as Anna Mignatieff. A Dutchman by birth, he had been 25 years in Asia, spoke 12 different languages, and followed closely and with interest the affairs of the world. He was, in short, a man of wide culture, endowed with no small share of talent, in this respect the exact opposite of Adam Ignatieff. He made his home in a Hindu caravansary, a miserable hovel without windows, and lived in a state of the greatest poverty, apparently long ago forgotten by his friends in Europe for it was seldom, if ever, that he received any letters. It was, however, a real pleasure to talk to him. He was both amusing and really witted, sang French songs with the same verve that he recited his Latin masses, and was a thorough original, if ever there was one. To see him striding at a smart pace through the Mohammedan bazaars with his long cloak, his broad-brimmed hat, his staff, his long beard, and his big spectacles always put me in mind of a gray friar monk, solitary, solitary, solitary. Such was the burden of his life song. A solitary man, he recited punctually every day the masses which none came to listen to. Solitary, he sat on the platform beside the door of his hovel and read, heedless of the bustle of the caravans that came and went. Solitary, he dressed the scanty fare which his poverty permitted him to eat. Solitary, he wandered about the roads of an evening, always and everywhere a solitary, lonely being. It was always a pleasure to me when I fell in with him. Many an hour we sat together, philosophizing over life, for I too was just as lonely a man as he. There was also a third missionary in the town, a Mohammedan, who had been converted to Christianity and baptized by the name of Johannes, or John, he had studied the Quran in Erzurum in Turkish Armenia, and from the minarets of the city cried to the faithful, There is no God but Allah, and Mohammed is his prophet. After being converted to Christianity, he spent two years at a mission school in Sweden, and the time of my visit to Kashgar, he chiefly occupied himself with translating the Bible into Turkey and the dialect of Kashgar, and with playing Swedish psalm tunes on a violin in the evening. Such were the happy destinies of the champions of the cross in that remotest of Chinese cities. I felt truly sorry for them. Their energies were wasted, their labors fruitless, their lives empty, hard, and of none account. During my first visit in Kashgar, I had the good fortune to come in contact with two pleasant English gentlemen, the famous traveler, Captain Young Husband, and Mr. McCartney. The former had in the interval returned to India. The latter still dwelt in Kashgar, occupying a comfortable house in a splendid situation close to the garden of Chinibag. On more than one occasion, he entertained Father Hendricks and myself with splendid hospitality. Mr. McCartney was the agent of the Indian government for Chinese affairs in Turkestan. He had a first-rate training and spoke fluently the principal languages of Europe and the Orient, being especially distinguished in Chinese. In fact, he was too good for his post. He was capable of rendering his country substantial services in a more distinguished sphere of action. I will now turn to the more eminent of the Chinese with whom I had relations during my stay in Kashgar. The highest official in each of the 19 provinces of China is the governor, and with him are associated the vice-governor, the head of the provincial treasury, the judge, and the procurators. Now, whereas the first four exercises authority over the whole of the province, the functions of the last official... The procurator, or Daotai, the man who shows the right way, are limited to a smaller district or subdivision of the province. For instance, in the province of Xinjiang, which embraces the whole of East Turkestan, Ili, a part of Dungaria, and a part of Gobi, there are several Daotais. Urumqi, the capital of the province, has one. Aksu has another. There's a third at Kashgar, and so on. The Daotai's sphere of authority is therefore less extensive than the spheres of his colleagues, 
but within his own sphere, his actual authority is, in several respects, superior to theirs, seeing that he enjoys the power to check and regulate their action, as well as to make representations to the central government, if he considers them lacking in the performance of their duty. The position he occupies is in many ways similar to that which was occupied by the Russian provincial procurators in the time of the Empress Catherine II, but with this fundamental difference, that whereas the functions of the Russian procurators were limited to protesting, the Chinese Daltai possesses, under certain circumstances, the power to command. My friend Shang, Daltai of Kashgar, exercised authority over a very extensive region, stretching northeastwards towards the boundary of the procuratorship of Aksu and embracing Kashgar, Marobashi, Yarkand, Khotan, Kirya, and Churchin. His duties are principally civil, but they also extend into the domain of military affairs. In that, he acts as paymaster to the troops and inspector of the commissariat. The district of Sarik Kol on the eastern Pamirs is administered like the similar frontier districts of the Russian and Afghan Pamirs by military officers. The Daotai of Kashgar is able to exercise a certain measure of influence upon the conduct of affairs in Sarik Kol, for he is authorized to give advice and furnish intelligence, but is not allowed to issue direct commands. When a young man, Shang was nothing more than a simple clerk to a mandarin, but having distinguished himself at the time of the first revolt in Tungaria, 1864, he rapidly mounted the ladder of promotion till he attained his present high position. Although no Adonis, he was from top to toe a thoroughly high principal gentleman. On ordinary days, he was wont to flit his saffron yellow body about in a little blue cart, but for ceremonious occasions and functions of high solemnity, he came out in magnificent attire, namely a robe of blue and black silk and the ample folds of which golden dragons played hide-and-seek whilst golden lions of fantastic shape climbed up a bewildering tangle of interlaced garlands. A mystic button on his silk skull cap proclaimed that he was a Darin, or Mandarin, of the second class. To complete his gala costume, he wore around his neck a long chain of hard fruit kernels, polished and carved on the outside. Upon arriving in Kashgar, one of my first duties was, of course, to go and pay my respects to this high and influential official. He received me in singularly polite and cordial fashion. He lived in a straggling yamen, consisting of a labyrinth of square courtyards with mulberry trees planted in the middle and wooden verandas running round the sides. The pillars which supported the verandas were decorated with Chinese ideographs and the walls of the building with mural paintings representing, for the most part, dragons and other fantastic animals. The Daotai himself received me at the first door and, with an affable smile, conducted me as far as the audience chamber, where we took our seats on opposite sides of a little square table and drank tea together and smoked out of silver pipes. Soldiers, armed with long, shafted halberds, kept watch beside the door, and a group of respectable yellow-skinned functionaries with well-preserved pigtails and buttons in their black silk caps stood like a circle of lighted candles all round the room keeping as silent and motionless as statues all the time the audience lasted. The Daotai himself wore the insignia of his lofty dignity. With the view of repaying honor with honor, I had put on my best dress suit of broadcloth and went to his palace riding a horse as white as fresh-fallen snow and escorted by a troop of Cossacks. For two hours we conversed together, or rather competed which should excel the other in paying compliments. The Daotai asked me how I liked his tea. I answered, how? that being the only Chinese word I knew. Thereupon he clapped his hands and said, By the memory of my fathers, what a marvelously learned man my guest is. A little later he told me that the river Tarim, which flowed out of Lapnar into the desert, reappeared again several thousand li distant and formed the great yellow river of China. At this, I gave him as good as I got. What a well-informed man your excellency is. You know everything. But I also let him hear a little plain truth as well. I told him how I had been received at Bulun Kul, the first place I entered on the Chinese side of the frontier, expressing my astonishment that I should have been treated with such discourtesy in face of the pass and letters of introduction I carried, and declaring my intention of making representations on the subject in higher quarters. Upon hearing this, the Daotai's face clouded, and with some show of emotion he begged me not to lodge a complaint. He would himself teach Yandar in a lesson. I promised, therefore, that 
For that once, I would let the matter drop, for of course I never had any intention of doing what I said. But I found that the only way to deal with the Chinese is to be positive in your statements and peremptory in your demands, if you wish to avoid being made ridiculous by their fantastic exaggerations. Towards the close of our interview, the Daotai reminded me that Kashgar possessed two chiefs, himself and the Russian consul general. The Mohammedans declare that Mr. Petrovsky is the true successor of the Chagatai Khans, who ruled over Kashgar from the death of Genghis Khan to past the middle of the 16th century. He pointed out that since I had taken up my quarters for a time with the Russian chief, it would only be right that I should also grant his Chinese colleague the honor of entertaining me, for at any rate a few days. I thanked him very, very much for the honor, but declined. The next day, the Daotai returned my visit, coming with all the pomp and circumstance of oriental display. At the head of the procession rode a herald, who at every fifth step sounded a gigantic gong. He was followed by several men armed with switches and whips, with which they dusted the jackets of everybody who had not the good sense to get out of their way. The great man himself rode in a little covered cart with three windows and two high wheels drawn by a mule, which was shaded by an awning held up by rods fixed to the shafts. On both sides of this state chariot walked attendants bearing huge parasols and lemon-colored standards inscribed with Chinese ideographs and black ink. The rear of the procession was brought up by a troop of soldiers, mounted on beautiful white horses, but wearing such fantastic uniforms as would have astounded even Doré. A Chinese dinner party. I cannot part from my Chinese friends in Kashgar without adding a brief account of a Chinese dinner party, which I shall never forget. I had scarcely recovered from dining at the house of Chen Daloi, a kind of mayor of the city, when I had the honor to be invited, along with the staff of the Russian consulate, to a similar function at the palace of the Daotai. I recollect something about an ancient Greek deity who swallowed his own offspring. I have read in Persian legend about the giant Zohak, who devoured two men's brains every day at a meal. I have heard rumors of certain African savages who invite missionaries to dinner and give their guests the place of honor inside the pot. I have been set agape by stories of monstrous big eaters who at a single meal could dispose of broken ale bottles, open pen knives, and old boots. But what are all these things as compared with a Chinese dinner of state, with its 64 courses embracing the most extraordinary products of the animal and vegetable worlds it is possible to imagine? For one thing, to mention no more, you need to be blessed with an extraordinarily fine appetite, or else be a Chinaman, to appreciate smoked ham dripping with molasses. When a Chinaman issues invitations to dinner, he sends out one or two days beforehand a tiny card of invitation contained in a huge envelope. If you accept the invitation, you're supposed to keep the card. If you have not time, that is, if you decline, you are expected to send it back. If the banquet is appointed for 12 o'clock, you need not go before 2 p.m. Should you, however, appear punctually, you will find your host taking his midday siesta and see neither guests, attendants, nor signs of dinner. When things are sufficiently advanced in your host's house, he sends off another messenger who comes and shows you his master's calling card. This is to be interpreted as a signal that you may now begin to address yourself, though you need not bustle about it. We, too, of the consulate made a truly gorgeous show as we rode in procession to the great man's palace. The place of honor at the head of the procession was filled by a sart from West Turkestan, the Aksakal, or chief of all the merchants and subjects of Russia, who dwelt in Kashgar. He wore a red velvet kalat, or coat, decorated with two or three Russian gold medals. Close behind him rode a Cossack, carrying the silk banner of the consulate, red and white, with a little blue cross stitched diagonally across the corner. Consul General Petrovsky and I rode in a sort of landau, escorted by two officers and by Adam Ignatieff in the long white coat with the cross and rosary round his neck. Last came a dozen Cossacks in white parade uniforms, curbing in their snorting horses with a tight rein. Thus arrayed in holiday magnificence, we rode under a broiling hot sun at a gentle pace through the narrow, dusty lanes of Kashgar, 
across the marketplace of Rigistan with its hundreds of tiny stalls shaded by thatched roofs, each supported by a slanting pole, past mosques, madrasas, and caravansaries, across the flea bazaar where old clothes are on sale, coming occasionally into collision with a caravan of camels or a string of donkeys laden with small casks of water, and entered at length the Chinese quarter of the city, full of quaint shops with up-curling roofs, painted dragons, and red advertisement signs. Finally, we drove in at the great gates of the Daotai's Yaman, and were there, received by His Excellency in person, surrounded by a band of beardless and wrinkled military attendants dressed in their gayest attire. We had not got further than the preliminary appetizer when the presence of Adam Ignatieff started His Excellency off on the subject of the missionary activity of the Europeans in China. He spoke in terms of great admiration of the Christian missionaries, praising their self-abnegation and disinterested zeal for the well-being of their fellow men. But, speaking with marked emphasis, he went on to add that he felt bound to look upon them as the authors and instigators of discord, setting members of the same family at variance, undermining the time-honored ordinance of domestic subordination, dividing the population into two hostile camps— I ventured to remind him of the murder of two Swedish missionaries in Song Po, of which I had just heard, but the Dao Tai professed total ignorance of the affair. Our host then conducted us and his Chinese guests to a little pavilion in the garden where dinner was to be served. Chinese etiquette prescribes that the host shall touch his forehead with the cup each guest drinks out of and thereupon present it to him, similarly with the chopsticks each guest eats with. The Dao Tai also shook each chair to prove that it was in a sound condition and passed his hand over the seat as if to brush away the dust. This performance over, we took our seats round the big red lacquered table. Next came in a string of servants, each bearing a little round porcelain dish with some preparation of food upon it. They put down the dishes along the center of the table. There were dozens of them, and the first supply was followed by others, time after time. In front of each guest stood still smaller dishes containing spices, sauces, and soy. If the guests neglected to help themselves, the host occasionally sent them portions of the delicacies which lined his own dishes, such as the skin, fins, and cartilage of different varieties of fish found in the seas and rivers of the Chinese empire, fungi, salted mutton fat cut into long strips, salamanders, ham with a great variety of widely different adjuncts, besides a multitude of strange preparations, the real constituents and names of which remained mysteries to me. As for tasting them, I really had no confidence in their suspicious appearance, still less in the rancid odors they gave off. The culminating triumph of the feast was smoked ham and molasses, washed down with tea and Chinese brandy, strong and boiling hot. The greater part of the numerous dishes served at the banquet had been brought from China proper, and consequently, owing to the vast distance, had a very considerable cost. Evidently, His Excellency, who at ordinary times lived very plainly himself, was desirous to show us every mark of respect. But I'm sorry to say we scarcely did justice to the skill of the Chinese cuisine, although a brillant savarin would no doubt have gone into raptures over it. The only person who worthily upheld the honor of Europe was Adam Ignatieff, but he did wonders, exciting the amazement of the rest of us and even the admiration of the Chinese themselves. With punctilious conscientiousness, he partook of every one of the 46 courses, and with the rosary still round his neck and the cross on his breast, drank 17 cups of brandy, stuff which to my throat was as hot and burning as sulfuric acid poured upon iron filings. And at the end of the three hours that the banquet lasted, he rose every whit as sober as when he took his seat at the beginning. The conclusion I came to about Chinese state banquets was that you require a certain amount of time to become accustomed to the many unfamiliar dishes which are put before you. All the same, several of them were excellent, some even quite delicious. Undoubtedly, the most delicious of all was the soup made from the edible nests of the swallow, or more correctly, swiftlet, a dish which is seldom served in this far-off region because of its extremely high price. On one of the walls there was painted two or three black flourishes. I inquired what they signified and was told they meant drink and tell racy stories, 
There was no need for any such admonition, for the spirit which reigned over the company was so hilarious, and we transgressed so wantonly against the strict rules of Chinese etiquette, that the Dao Tai and his compatriots must surely have blushed for us a score of times, had not their skins been from infancy as yellow as sun-dried haddocks. We were entertained all through the dinner by melodies of a sart orchestra consisting of drums, flutes, and singers, whilst the monotonous music was occasionally enlivened by a couple of dancing boys, as though we were not dizzy enough without their gyrations. As soon as the last of the sixty-four courses had disappeared, the guests, following the rigorous law of custom, instantly rose to take their leave. That moment was one which I had long been anxiously waiting for, for I was dying for a cigar and a glass of sherry with iced water to banish the recollection of one of the most extraordinary banquets it has ever been my lot to be present at. As we drove home, the streets, the markets, the bazaars were silent and empty. The only persons we saw there were a few solitary wanderers, a dervish or a leprous beggar. The sun set behind the airy contours of the Terechtevan Pass. The twilight lasted only just long enough to make the bare announcement that a new night was approaching. Then the Orient lay down and dreamed again on its own grave. I shall not easily forget the many happy hours I spent in Consul Petrovsky's society. It is always a pleasure to me to go over them again in my thoughts, for as I have already said, he was really an extraordinary man, both in the matter of experience and general culture. I owe him a very deep debt of gratitude, not only for his unstinted hospitality, but also for the extremely valuable advice he gave me, drawn from the storehouse of his wide experience. He has lived twelve years in Kashgar, and no man possesses a more intimate knowledge of that region than he does. To many, it may seem like transportation for a well-educated man to have to spend so many of the best years of his life in a place like Kashgar. But it was nothing of the sort to Mr. Petrovsky. He had learned to like the place, and he had an inexhaustible fund of interest in its historical and archaeological treasures which he had unearthed. There was one thing about Mr. Petrovsky which had for me an especial attraction. He was always cheerful, always in excellent good humor. For, when you come to think of it, what is there that can give greater or truer pleasure than to associate with people who see life and the world in bright colors and who are perfectly contented with the lot destiny has shaped for them? At the same time, he was both philosopher and critic. With biting wit and scathing irony, he would lash the minor follies of the world, more especially everything that savored of toadyism and servility. Throughout all my travels, I have met no man who made a deeper or more real impression upon me than Mr. Petrovsky, nor is there any I would so gladly meet again and yet again. In a word, I had a splendid time of it in Kashgar. I was quartered in a cozy little room at a pavilion in the consulate garden, and after breakfast used to stroll backwards and forwards under the shady mulberry and plane trees, along a terrace which commanded a wide view of the desolate regions through which I was shortly to journey on my way to the Far East. I had constant company in a colony of swallows which had built their nests under the projecting eaves and which were quite at home, flying freely in and out of the open doors and windows. For the summer air being warm, the doors and windows stood wide open all day and all night long. On Easter morning I was awakened by the clear and melodious echoes of a church bell, which the day before had arrived from Naryansk and was hung in the chapel of the Russian consulate. I spent my time there working all day and wrote two or three geographical papers. Altogether, it was in every way a delightful existence and just suited me down to the ground. I heard the wind whispering in the tops of the plane trees. What it really said, I knew not, but I loved to dream that it was bringing me greetings from home. Little did I know then that I had still three whole years of hard travel before me in the heart of Asia. My life was, however, anything but solitary. Apart from the staff of the consulate, the place swarmed with Orientals, Sarts and Kyrgyz, who would come in and out on business or pleasure. Then there was a crowd of Mohammedan servants, and a Chinese interpreter, to say nothing of hens and chickens, to the number of 300, turkeys, geese, and ducks, a monkey, four parrots, and more than a dozen dogs. I was on good terms with the whole menagerie, with the sole exception of the monkey. His favor I could not succeed in winning, even when I resorted to such tempting delicacies as apples and pears. 
During my seven weeks stay in Kashgar, I often discussed my plans of travel with Mr. Petrovsky, especially how my journeys ought to be arranged so that I might visit each region in the season most favorable for reaping a successful harvest of observations. The result of our conversations was a total alteration of the original idea with which I left Europe. Instead of exploring all the regions I had set my mind upon in one continuous and unbroken journey, as I had at first intended, I decided to carry out my purpose in a series of longer or shorter expeditions, all starting from Kashgar as a center. By that means, I should be able to carry my observations to a place of safety as I made them, to develop my photographic plates, pack and send off home my collections, as well as have an excellent base at which to make preparations for each fresh expedition. I intended my first journey to be to Lopnor, that being the object upon which my heart was most set. But in the beginning of June, the weather underwent a sudden change. Summer, the Asiatic summer, was upon us almost before we were aware of it. The sky glowed like a gigantic furnace. The temperature rose to 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. The queen of the night was powerless to infuse coolness into the superheated atmosphere of East Turkestan. And every afternoon the desert wind blew in across the ancient capital of Yakob Beg, dry, burning, impregnated with fine dust, filling the streets with a stifling, impenetrable haze. And as the summer advanced, the heat would increase, as well as grow more intense the nearer we traveled towards the middle of the continent. I thought of the superheated atmosphere, heavily charged with dust, vibrating above the dunes of drift sand. I thought of the whirlwinds, which every afternoon dry up and down the banks of the Tarim. I thought of the thousand miles of long, difficult marches across the unending waterless deserts, and I shuddered. It was only the other day, as it were, that I had been living in nearly 40 degrees Fahrenheit of frost, high up on the Pamirs. I should be all the more sensitive to the burning heat of the desert. At the eleventh hour, therefore, I resolved to spend the summer in the higher regions and continue my observations in the eastern Pamirs and wait for the winter or the spring before starting for Lopnor. On October 19th, I once more took possession of my room at the consulate in Kashgar, delighted to see the pile of newspapers and letters which had accumulated during the course of the summer. I now settled down at the house of my old friend, Consul General Petrovsky, and was able to enjoy a period of much-needed rest. We spent the long autumn evenings, as before, by the fireside, discussing many an important Asiatic problem. I will not dwell upon my reminiscences of Kashgar, except a couple of incidents which I must mention. My first care was to arrange and label my geological specimens from the Mustag Atta, and to develop the photographs I had taken. After that, I wrote a few scientific papers on the work of the summer. In the beginning of November, a breath of air from Europe penetrated to our lonely colony in the Far East. Mr. Kabeko, a privy councillor who was making a tour of inspection through Russian Turkestan, arrived in Kashgar. He was a pleasant, refined, and well-read man, and during the week he stayed with us, the days flew past more quickly than usual. I shall never forget the evening of November 6th, the anniversary of the day on which the great Gustavus Adolphus died. We were all sitting round the large drawing-room table, tea glass in hand, talking politics and discussing the future of East Turkestan, to the crackling of the fire and the singing of the samovar, when a breathless Cossack courier entered the room without knocking and going up to Mr. Kabeko, handed him a telegram from Gulja, the last station of the Russian telegraph system. It contained news of the death of the Emperor Alexander III. All present rose to their feet, and the Orthodox Russians made the sign of the cross. Deep sorrow was depicted on every countenance, and for a long time there was a dead silence in the room. It had only taken the short space of five days for the sad news to penetrate into the very heart of Asia. The day after the arrival of the telegram, the Daotai and Chen Daloi came to offer their condolences to Council Petrovsky. With their many colored ceremonial costumes, their gongs and drums, their parasols and standards, and with all their pomp and state, they presented a strange contrast to the silent sorrow of the Russians. The rest of the violent changes of climate that I had been exposed to was an attack of fever, which came on in the middle of November, and kept me a prisoner in bed for a month. Another misfortune overtook me in the Russian bath, 
to which I went accompanied by two Cossacks and Islam Bai. The bath was heated and everything arranged, but after I had been in a considerable time, the Cossacks imagined that I ought to have had enough of it and came to see what I was doing. On their entrance, they found that I had fainted. Some pipe in the heating apparatus had sprung a leak, and the fumes nearly did for me. The men took me to my room at once, and I gradually came round. But for two days afterwards, I had a splitting headache. Then came Christmas. Christmas, what a host of memories, of regrets, of hopes, lie in that one word. Yes, it was Christmas in Kashgar. The snow fell softly, but evaporated immediately in the arid atmosphere so that it did not even make the ground white. There was a sound of bells in the streets and marketplace, but they were caravan bells and rang all the year round. The stars shone brightly in the sky, but not with the same magic brilliance as those of our northern winter lights. A light twinkled here and there in the windows of the houses, but... They were not Christmas candles swinging on the fire branches, only lamps fed with conjet oil, as simple as in the time of Christ himself. Could there be a more suitable person to pay a visit to on this holy tide than the Swedish missionary, Mr. Hegberg, who had come to Kashgar with his family during the summer? Mr. McCartney, the English agent, and Father Hendricks went with me, and we took a few small presents for Mr. Hegberg's little girl. The time-worn lessons for the day were read, and the Christmas psalm was sung to an accompaniment on the harmonium. Then, in the darkness of Christmas Eve, Father Hendricks and I strolled round to Mr. McCartney's house, where mulled wine and Christmas chair awaited us. But shortly after midnight, Father Hendricks went away, nor could we persuade him to stay longer. He was going home to his... Lonely cabin in the Hindu caravansary, and on the stroke of twelve would read the Christmas Mass alone. Alone. Always alone. On January 5th, 1895, Mr. St. George Littledale, with his undaunted wife and a relative, Mr. Fletcher, arrived at Kashgar, and I spent many a pleasant hour in their company. Mr. Littledale was unusually genial, manly, and unassuming in character, and I esteemed it a great privilege thus to make the acquaintance of one of the most intrepid and able of living Asiatic travelers. He himself regarded his own travels with critical eye, and was always modest, and had no pretensions. He said that he traveled simply for the pleasure, for the sport, and because the active, changing life was more to his taste than the gaieties of London. But with the journey he began in the year 1895, he has written his name indelibly in the annals of Asiatic exploration, by the side of those of his distinguished countrymen, young husband and bower. In the middle of January, our English friends left Kashgar in four large carts draped with carpets, and an imposing sight they made as they drove out of Mr. McCartney's yard. They equipped their large caravan in Churchen, and thence crossed Tibet from north to south. Then came the Russian Christmas, twelve days after ours, and the consulate became busy and animated again. Cossack waits woke me up with plaintive songs on Christmas morning, and in the consul's house there were great festivities. It was a great pleasure to me, on my return to Kashgar, to meet a fellow countryman in the person of the missionary Mr. Hegberg, who had come here with his wife and little girl, a Swedish lady missionary and a converted Persian, one Mirza Joseph. In the first place, coming there at all with two ladies had been an imprudence. For the Mohammedans could not be brought to believe other than that Mr. Hegberg had two wives. But when, later on, Mirza Joseph married the Swedish lady missionary, the prospects of the mission in that town were destroyed for many a year to come. For in the eyes of the people of Kashgar, Mirza Joseph was still a Mohammedan, and such, according to the Quran, are forbidden to choose their wives from among an unbelieving people. I gladly pass over the construction put upon this marriage and the unpleasantness it caused, but to many in Kashgar it afforded a painful illustration of the way in which missionary work is often mismanaged and how lightly missionaries take the grave responsibilities which they have voluntarily incurred. When Mr. Hegberg found that it would be dangerous to begin an active propaganda at once, he wisely restricted his energies to the manufacture of various common household articles, such as the people of Kashgar would find useful, and such as they made themselves in a very primitive fashion. For instance, he constructed a capital machine for the treatment of raw silk, to say nothing of spinning wheels, bellows, etc., all extremely well made and a source of admiration and astonishment to the natives. It was always a pleasure to meet him and his wife, for like all the other missionaries with whom I have come in contact, they were kind and hospitable people and looked at the future from the bright side. 
One cannot but respect people who labor for their faith and the light of honest conviction, despite the errors of judgment they may fall into. Okay, that last bit was written by Sven Hedin, recalling Christmas 1894 in Kashgar. Hedin had just returned from attempting to scale Mustag Atta, one of the highest peaks located on the northern edge of the Tibetan Plateau. This mountain range is immense, and Hedin was trying to conquer one of its highest peaks. It would take until 1956 before someone got to the top of that mountain. So, that was today's morsel. You know, this time period is so fascinating. All this time while Sven Hedin is out exploring all these uncharted parts of Central Asia, playing in the background was this uh, thing known as the Great Game. This was a high-stakes game played by the British and the Russians. Sven Hedin's time in and around Xinjiang, 1894, the Great Game was mostly over, but just barely. The reverberations were still felt. This is Romanov dynasty Russia. The, the Bolshevik Revolution was still a good two decades away. So the British had a lot of chips invested in their Indian enterprise. And the farther away they could keep the Russians, the better. So fortunately, there was this big fat buffer between Russia and India, namely Central Asia. But due to a whole bunch of historic events that I won't burden you with. The Russians were doing all they could to creep southward and control territory. And whatever they couldn't control, they at least tried to influence. And the British were, of course, doing everything they could to keep the Russians in Russia. With the signing of uh, the kind of a treaty in 1895 that created that, I don't know if you're familiar with it, that panhandle-like appendage that juts out of northeast uh, Afghanistan, uh, with that created, the boundaries of where Russian influence began and ended was sort of defined. Still, however, when Sven Hedin mixed with Petrovsky and McCartney, the feeling of the uh, great game was still there. And both those two men were giants of the great game. Consul General Nicholas Petrovsky and the British Consul George McCartney. Petrovsky and McCartney couldn't stand each other, but they were both admirers of Hedin. George McCartney was the eldest son of another legend, Sir Holiday McCartney. He had quite a career in China. He was a relative of the first Earl McCartney of the famous McCartney mission, 1792-1793. Uh, uh, he fought with Charles Chinese Gordon during the Taiping Rebellion and ended up marrying a niece of Li Hongzhang and served as a civil servant in the Qing dynasty, sort of like uh, what Marco Polo did during the Yuan, or perhaps didn't. He had an incredible career in China and in Britain, working with the Chinese officials stationed there. So his son George, George McCartney, who Sven Hedin was so enamored with, served in Kashgar for 28 years. George McCartney, by the way, originally came to Kashgar as the interpreter for the immortal... Sir Francis Edward Young Husband, another great man of the 19th century, one of the major players during the heat of the great game, another one mentioned in Sven Hedin's book. Such an interesting cast of characters that all found themselves together in one place at the same time. Petrovsky, McCartney, Father Hendricks, Adam Ignatieff, the Daotai, and I'm sure there were many other bit players in this whole slice of Central Asian and Chinese history. You heard the term Sart more than once. A Sart was a general term to describe any Muslim from the regions of Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Afghanistan. It's unclear who actually were the Sarts, but that was a term you heard regularly up in that area. Anyway, we'll pick up next time with some readings from Volume 2 of Sven Hedin's book, Through Asia. Until then, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off, as usual, from the city of Los Angeles, down in the southern part of California, the Golden State, not the Sunshine State, that's Florida. Feel free to visit the China History Podcast and the Chinese Sayings Podcast over at teacup.media whenever you feel so inclined. You won't be disappointed. Take care, everyone, and see you next time for another antiquarian classic here at the China Vintage Hour.